As you saw from some of the previous videos, it's hard to do much with programming or RPA without dealing with variables. So in this section, we'll talk about variables. We'll start with how to create variables from the ribbon. Then we'll discuss the variables pane, which allows you to manage your variables. And when we create variables, there's a limited number of types that are available in the UI. Sometimes you need to browse for special variable types. For instance, when you want to deal with currency, you're going to need to use a decimal type, and that's not one of the basic types that's immediately available to you when you're creating a variable. So you'll need to use a special feature of UiPath to select that type. Then we'll move on and we'll talk about using the assign activity to create new variables and to update their values. We'll discuss how variables can be used as the output of other activities. I'll spend a little time talking about variable scope. And finally, sometimes you'll create variables with a limited scope and realize later in your automation that you need access to those variables from other activities outside of the original scope. So in those cases, sometimes it makes sense to promote a variable to global scope. So we'll discuss how to do that as well. Let's jump into it. In this video, we'll talk about the variables pane down here at the bottom. We've seen how we can create a variable up here in the ribbon using create variable. And when we do create those variables, they show up down here in the variables pane, which can be shown and hidden using the variables label. You'll notice that below our existing variables, there's a row here that says create variable. If I click in there, you can see that a new row has been added and it pushed my previous variables up. So to see them all, I can click on this and expand it. So now we can see everything. This variable was created as a string by default. And since we were inside this sequence, it was created with a scope of sequence. I can rename this to my string variable or whatever you want. Notice again, I'm not using double quotes there. And if I want to, I can click here and I can change the type of this variable to a Boolean or an int 32 or an object or even an array of T. And if you don't know what these things are, be sure to check out my RPA Tech Primer video. So I'll select Boolean. And if I wanted to, I could click here and change the scope to one of the available scopes within my workflow. So if I select flowchart, now that variable scope is part of flowchart. And we'll talk about scope more in a future video. I could also change the default value if I want to something like true or false, since it's a Boolean. And now if I navigate back out to main and shrink down my variables window here, you can see now we're back out here in our flowchart. So you can imagine that if I click on create variable again, and I name this my new flowchart variable, again, by default, it's created as a string, but now you can see that the scope is flowchart. So I just wanted to show you that you can use the variables pane to create new variables and to update every aspect of any given variables row. Notice, however, that if you created a variable as a string and it has a default that's a string value, of course, if you change this to int 32 and move away, it's saying there's a compiler error because the tool can't convert this string value to an int 32. So it's up to you to put in some kind of an integer value to get rid of that warning. There are some other cool features about this variables pane. If you click on any one of these headers, you'll notice that you can sort the variables by any column. And eventually when you get lots of variables in here, you're going to appreciate that. Typically, when you first create a variable and you go to the variables pane, you'll find that variable at the top of the list for quick and easy access. But later on, when you come back and you know the name of a given variable starts with P, you're going to want to sort by name and scroll down the list until you find the P's. When you're viewing your topmost activity and you're seeing all the variables, sometimes being able to sort by scope is handy so you can get a visual sense for which variables are part of which activities and you actually can't sort by default value, which is probably sensible. If you right click on any row, you have the ability to delete a variable. And when you click on delete, it doesn't prompt you. So if it turns out that was a mistake, make sure you remember that you can use control Z and bring that variable right back. You may also have noticed when I right click, I can add an annotation. And that simply pops up a text window that allows me to type some interesting details that might help the user understand why this variable exists. When you click on OK, you can see this little symbol here shows up. And when you hover over it, you can see the value of that annotation. Now, if you right click again, you see that you can edit the annotation or delete the annotation. When you click edit, you can add more information. And when you click OK, 
and hover again. Now you can see all that information. Of course, when you right click and you delete the annotation, that goes away. That's also undoable. And believe it or not, I think that's a pretty handy feature to have because if you're dealing with a complex automation that you didn't create and you're debating about whether a particular variable could be updated or removed in some way, sometimes having an annotation like this can prevent a catastrophe. So the last thing I'll point out about the variable section, like I said, if you have this thing collapsed and you drill into some kind of an activity and you right click and create a variable inside that activity, and let's call this Z my variable, so we know it should show up at the end of the list. When I click OK, notice that even though we don't have anything set here as a sort column, that new variable showed up right here close to the top. And UiPath does that, so when you first create a variable, it's easy to find and modify if you need to do that. Then like I mentioned, you can use the sorting here to more easily find it in the future. Oftentimes, when you're working on an automation, you'll find that you need to create variables that are outside of the default list of variables provided by the tool. And if you go down here into the variables pane and you create a new variable, the options you're going to get are boolean, int, string, object, array of t, and so on. But notice down here at the bottom, we've got this thing called browse for types. So hopefully that makes perfect sense that you could click on this and it opens up a brand new window. Now this might be a little bit intimidating if you're not comfortable with the .NET framework. And again, I know I'm repeating myself, but if you are a business person and you've never dealt with programming or the .NET framework, then be sure to check out my RPA Tech Primer course. But for those of you who are familiar with the .NET classes and types, you probably already know we're looking for a decimal type to store a currency. So if I type in decimal up here at the top, you can see still there are many things to choose from. So you've got to have the technical sense to be able to rapidly parse through this list and realize that you're looking for a system decimal. And if I double click on that or click OK, now you can see that the type of this variable is system.decimal. And I can type in 125 and move away and notice I'm not getting any kind of a validation error there. So I'll show you one more example of this. Let's say that we wanted to have a list of strings. And if I click in here, I can select an array of T. Notice when I do that, I get a slightly smaller and less intimidating picker here that allows me to choose what T is going to be in my array. So in this case, it's easy. I can just choose string because I wanted an array of strings and I click OK. And now notice it says that it's a system string array, which is what I wanted. But what if I wanted an array of decimals? Much in the same way that we chose browse for types for a single decimal, we can select array of T, then click on our type dropdown and again, go to browse for types here. Once again, our variable picker shows up. We type in decimal and grab system decimal. And now you can see we're going to have an array of system decimals. As easy as that. So we've seen how we can use the ribbon to create variables, and we can use this variables pane down here to create variables as well. Now I'd like to focus on using a special activity called assign and we'll see how using this activity allows us to be able to create new variables, but also to be able to assign different values to existing variables. To demo this, I'm going to connect my start to my sequence and double click on my sequence. This will just allow us to be able to run the robot and see some things happen. So I'll click and drag this assign activity into our sequence. If you look over here at the top right, you see that the only real controls we have are to and value. So here we have the option to right click and create a variable or we could type in the name of an existing variable if one exists. Notice down here we don't have any variables yet, so if I right click, I'll call my variable first name, and when I move away from that field, you can see the name of that variable shows up in my assign activity. And it also shows up down here in my variables tab. It was created as a generic value, and the scope is this sequence that is apparent to our assign activity. I'm gonna change this, to a string, and I'm going to open up some double quotes and set the first name value to Brian. When I click away from that, you can see that the default value was not set, but I have set the value of the first name variable to the string Brian. I'll type in message box and click and drag a message box into our sequence, and inside here I'll open up my double quotes and I'll type in first name holds the value colon space and then I'll use the plus sign and type the name of my variable 
and you can see the IntelliSense there shows up, so I can just hit Tab and move away. So now when this robot runs, our flowchart will send us into the sequence. The sequence will create a variable, assign Brian to that variable, and then display a message box showing that name. So I'll run the robot, and sure enough, we're seeing exactly what we would expect. So that's how we can use the assign activity to create a new variable and assign a value to it. Let's say that inside this variables pane here, we create a new variable, and I'll just name it some number, and I'll set that to an int 32, and I'll leave the scope set to sequence. I'll set the default value of some number to three with no quotes, because this is an integer and not a string. And here I'll type some number is, and then we'll display the value of that variable. And notice that we're getting an error here because the robot can't automatically add this integer value to this string. So we have to use dot to string to make this work. So you'll see here in the sequence, I'm not setting the value of some number. It's getting its value from the default here. So let's run it. As you would expect, some number is three. So now let's take a look at how we can use the assign activity to assign a different value to that variable some number. So instead of right-clicking to create a new variable here, what I'll do instead is type in SOM, and you can see the IntelliSense shows us some number because it's an existing variable. So I'll hit Tab to select that, and this time I'll supply the value of 5. So now the variable pane is where this variable gets created with a default of 3, but then our assign activity comes along and sets the value of 5 to it. Let's run the robot and see. So there you go, some number is five. So you can see now that we can use the assign activity to create new variables or assign values to existing variables. Now it's important to realize that this doesn't have to be some simple assignment. You can type in any kind of a .NET expression here that you want to, as long as it makes sense for the variable type. So if I try to type in five here as a string, of course I'm gonna get an error because I can't assign a string value to an integer variable but I can do five plus 20 or any other sensible mathematical formula here. So when we run the robot now, you can see we get some number is 25 as expected. You can do the same thing with strings and here I'm just putting in a space after my first name and then a space in my last name. So now those two string values will be concatenated into one value for first name. And of course, if we change this to first name is, I can change that to first name, run the robot, and you can see our variable is now Brian Lamb. I have one too many spaces in there, but you get the idea. Do you think that we can assign one variable to another variable? Let's give it a try. I'll make a copy of some number. And of course, since some number is an integer, I can't assign that to my first name value because that's a string variable. But if I add on dot to string here, now that's valid because I'm going to assign the value of 25 as a string to first name. So when I run the robot, we see first name is 25. So that's the basics of using the assign activity to create and set the value of variables. Oftentimes when you're creating automation, you'll find yourself having to use some kind of an activity that stores its output into a variable. And what I mean by that is if I type in read text here, and I drag my read text file into my sequence, notice that I'm prompted to put in a file name here, or over here on the right side, I can scroll through and look at my configurable properties. So the file name, I would open my double quotes, type in c backslash sumfile.txt, and when the activity reads that file, it's going to want to put the data from that file into a variable, and it's expecting a string. Your first tendency might be just to start typing here and say my file contents and hit return. What's interesting is you don't get any warnings. And if we jump down to our variables and we scroll through the variables, notice that we have no variables that say my file contents. So this is one small problem that I have with UiPath. They don't alert you to the fact that that variable doesn't exist. Until you click into the field and hover over this, now it says my file contents is not declared. But if you're not paying attention and you click away, notice you're no longer getting that warning. So I'm belaboring this point because it's very easy to make this mistake. 
Whenever you have an opportunity like this to provide a variable for some activity, always make sure that you right click and select create variable. And it's off the screen right now, but the shortcut for this is control plus K. And when you're watching all the UiPath training videos, they use that shortcut a lot. So you'll see variables getting created quickly and it looks like they're just typing it in. But what they've really done is they've set the context here. They've used control K and now you can see the set name pops up. So that's how you know when you're creating a new variable. If you don't see set name and you simply start typing, your variable will not get created. So control K is certainly the fast way to do it. I like to right click on it just to remind myself that's what I'm doing. So now I can type in file contents with no quotes around it and hit return. And I make sure to click on this activity that needs that variable. When I open up the variables tab, now we can see file contents exists in my list of variables. In this case, it was created as a string by default, but don't be surprised when certain variables get created as a generic value when you do that same process. And in some cases, you might be tempted to change that generic value to something more specific. But most of the times, if you do that, the activity will throw an error until you change it back to generic. So a perfect case in point, if you want to get an asset from the orchestrator server, you would use an activity called get asset. So if I drag that into my sequence and I click on it to set my focus, you can see it's asking me for the name of the asset. So here I'll just type in my asset, even though this doesn't exist. And down here, you can see we have the same kind of output situation. So when I click in here, if I was to start typing, I would not get a new variable. So I'm going to right click, say create variable, and I'll just name this my asset. When I hit return and jump into the variables tab, you can see my asset exists and it was created as a generic value. Even if your asset is a string, don't be tempted to change that to a string because get asset wants it to be a generic value. Later on when you use it, you'll have to say my asset dot to string. So the last thing I want to show you is that you don't always have to create a new variable when you're using these activities that require an output variable. For instance, you can see I have this variable one here. I'm gonna rename this to something like my other file and you see that it is a string. So if I go here to read text file and go back down to that output variable, I previously had file contents. I can select and delete that and I can come back and click in the field and start typing in the name of this variable, my other file. So I make sure I set the context on that activity, click in here and type my, and notice I get a list of all my variables and I can double click on my other file. And now instead of creating a new variable, the file is going to be read into an existing variable in this variables pane. So hopefully all that made sense. In future videos, we're going to be putting automation together and using that feature frequently. So if you don't feel perfectly comfortable with this right now, watch the video again, try it yourself, and then later on we'll do some automation demos and I'll be sure to show this feature many times. In this video, I wanna give you a quick demo of variable scope. And in doing so, I'm going to assume that you know what variable scope is and why you need it. If you don't know what variable scope is or why we need it, be sure to check out my RPA Tech Primer course. For this demo, I'm gonna jump back into main and delete this sequence. And let's take a look at our existing variables to see what's there. Notice it's not showing anything. And if I click on flowchart, it does show variables. So you can see right away that UiPath will only display variables that are relevant to a given activity we've clicked on. And of course, it'll also show global variables as well, regardless of which activity you've clicked on. So for a clean slate, I'm going to delete all of these variables. So we start with nothing. And to give us a little more real estate, I'm gonna close up this ribbon and move this to the side. So as you can see, I have a flowchart here, which represents the topmost node of my automation. So what I'm gonna do is create a few sequences. I'll drag this one on first. I'll rename this to outer sequence. I'll rename my float chart to top of workflow and I'll double click on outer sequence and drag another sequence inside there. And I'll rename this one inner sequence one and I'll double click on that. So now you can see we're inside inner sequence one and I'll drag another sequence inside there and I'll name that inner sequence two. So now if we look at this outline pane on the bottom right, you can see I have a flow chart called top of workflow and inside of that, I've got this outer sequence sequence and inside of that, inner sequence one, inside of that, inner sequence two. So what I want to demonstrate first is 
if I have inner sequence two selected and I double click on it, if I create a variable right now called inner sequence two, and for this demo, it's not gonna matter what my types are. If I pull this in a little bit, you can see that the scope of this new variable called inner sequence two, and I'll just add the word var to that. You can see that my inner sequence two var has a scope of inner sequence two. So what that means is if I click on inner sequence one, notice I'm not seeing any variables because the logic that's going to take place inside inner sequence one isn't going to know anything about the data in that variable that has a scope limited to inner sequence two. So as far as inner sequence one is concerned, this variable inside inner sequence two doesn't even exist. Now I can do the same thing by clicking on inner sequence one and either using my ribbon up here at the top or simply right clicking and selecting create variable or just typing in here and naming this inner sequence one var and notice that one has a scope of inner sequence one. So now what happens if I click on inner sequence two? Notice that since inner sequence two is nested inside of inner sequence one, inner sequence two can see its variable and it can also see inner sequence one because that was declared in a higher scope above inner sequence two. So you can see that the variable scope cascades as you nest deeper and deeper. If I click out here to my top of workflow flowchart, you can see again I have no variables in my variables pane. Because as far as top of workflow is concerned, the variables inside of inner sequence one and inner sequence two don't even exist. So let's say I go back to top of workflow and I drag another sequence in here and I'll just name that next sequence. And let's say we connect these things up. So our automation is going to go from this sequence to the next sequence. Let's say I'm in here and I drag another sequence in and I've got this thing that's really important to do, whatever it is. And I add several activities in here that need to do some important work. You'll notice once I'm inside here, of course I'm not gonna see any of those variables that were created because this scope only knows about its own variables. So what if my something important activity needs to have that data contained in a variable somewhere down here in inner sequence one or inner sequence two? If we look over here again in our outline pane, we can see that the inner sequence two variable is in a completely different branch than our something important activity. So of course, this is not going to be able to see the variables that were created over here. But what we could do is we could promote the scope of the variable inside inner sequence two so that it exists in a scope that's above something important. So if we go back to inner sequence two, and let's say it's this variable right here, and if we click on this scope dropdown, you can see our options. This variable scope can either be inner sequence two, which is where it currently is, or we can promote it to inner sequence one, which would be right there, and we still wouldn't be able to access it. Or we can put it in the outer sequence, and that outer sequence is a sibling to next sequence. Do you think that something important will be able to see it if I put it in outer sequence? Let's go take a look. And that's where this outline pane is so useful. Instead of clicking around on these breadcrumbs and double clicking on sequences, I can just jump right over here and look. Notice I can't see the variable. So if we go back to inner sequence two, Notice that since the variable is now in a scope of outer sequence, we can still see it in inner sequence two, and we can make a decision to promote it even higher up to our top of workflow. So now this variable has a scope of top of workflow, way up here, which is a parent to both outer and next sequence. So if I drill down here into something important, you can see that now I can see my inner sequence two variable because I promoted its scope from way down here all the way to top of workflow. And like I said, since top of workflow is a parent or a container of next sequence, that variable can be seen inside of next sequence and also inside of something important. So hopefully that gives you a great summary of the process for creating variables and the impact of where those variables are created. The best practice is typically to create variables with the most narrow scope possible and only promote them into outer scopes when you later determine that it's necessary to have that information somewhere else. There's actually more to say about the scope of variables when we start talking about extracting workflows, but I'll be covering that in a future lecture.